You may not realize it, but water is actually invisible. It's hidden all around us right here in this room. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If you take 683 gallons of water, that would allow you to grow six pounds of alfalfa hay. And if you take those six pounds of hay and you put them into a machine that looks like this, <laughs> it will give you one gallon of milk. So that one gallon of milk may not look so large, but in a sense, it represents almost 700 gallons of water. And it's not just milk, it's all of the food that we eat. A grape, not a bunch of grapes, one grape, consumes about a third of a gallon. One walnut, about five. A potato, more than six. A cup of coffee, and not a venti latte at Starbucks, just a cup of coffee. 37 gallons. If it were a latte, it would be a lot more. I just told you dairy is very water intensive. For example, a Greek yogurt is about 90 gallons. And the real water intensive food is meat, especially beef. One hamburger is over 600 gallons of water. It's not just food, though, it's also materials, things. If you want to make steel, you need water. One pound of steel, which is not a very big piece of steel, will take about 11 gallons of water. And you can say the same for cement, lumber, plastic, all of the raw materials we use take water to make. What that means is the clothes that you're all wearing, the phone that's in your pocket, the car that you drove to get here, all represent enormous amounts of water. Now, there's not literally 40,000 gallons of water in your car, of course. That would not be good for your miles per gallon. But your car represents about 40,000 gallons of water. What we call this is virtual water. Now, an important point about water is that you cannot move large amounts of water around the Earth. If a country in North Africa, where it's dry, wanted to purchase water from us here in the Great Lakes region, there is no feasible way for us to get a relevant amount of water from here to there. But you can move goods around the world. And when you're moving goods, whether it's food or cars or anything else, you are moving water, virtual water, around the world. And there are countries that are net virtual water importers and countries that are net virtual water exporters. And it is, as you'd expect, the countries that are drier tend to be virtual water importers, mostly for food. Let me give you an example of how this plays out. There's a company based in Saudi Arabia called Al Marai. Now, you may not have heard of it, but this is the largest vertically integrated dairy company in the world. Al Marai is Arabic for the pasture. And in this case, the pasture is not in Saudi Arabia. The pasture is in Argentina, in South America, where Al Marai grows alfalfa hay using the local water resources. And then that alfalfa hay is shipped over to Saudi Arabia to feed cattle to make dairy for regional consumption. So there is this massive movement of virtual water from South America to the Middle East. And to the best of my knowledge, there is no international policy overseeing this process. It's completely unregulated. That doesn't mean it's necessarily bad to be moving water in this way, but what it means is most likely we are not using this resource, this precious resource of water, in the most sustainable and smart way. Now, if you were going to make such a policy, you need to do a smart policy. And that is because water has flavors. And I don't mean this. <laughs> what I mean is water can be said to be blue, green, or gray. Blue water is the water that most of us think of when we think of water. It's what comes out of your tap. It's what's sitting in Lake Michigan. Green water is the water that came down as rain and ended up in the soil or the plants. And if water becomes polluted, we say that it is gray. Now, each one of those examples I gave you, grapes, steel, smartphones, they all have a water footprint, and that water footprint is made up of some fraction of blue, some fraction of green, some fraction of gray. And it's important to know what those are. Now, there's an, another important distinction to make here, and that is 
blue water is not all the same either. It depends where you get it from. Your options are to pull it from the surface, the lakes and the rivers, or you can dig a well and pump water out from an aquifer under the ground, so-called groundwater. The reason this distinction is so important is that we do a lot of that ladder, pulling water out from under the ground, and in most cases, that's completely unsustainable because that groundwater is not being replenished by Mother Nature very rapidly, if at all. So another example for you. The country of Libya built something called the Great Man-Made River. This is a massive collection of pipes which move groundwater under the Sahara Desert for their needs, tapping into some very old aquifer. And they spent over 30 billion US dollars to make the Great Man-Made River, and it's projected to only last for about 20 years. So let's take a look at how the water on Earth is distributed. We've got a lot of water on Earth, but almost all of it is inside the oceans. About 97% of the water on Earth is in our oceans. And that salty seawater is not especially useful for watering your crops or brushing your teeth. The fresh water on Earth represents only about 3%, which is still actually a lot of water. But let's take a closer look at that 3%. The majority of that 3% of fresh water is locked up in places like ice caps and glaciers where we can't get at it. So don't even count that water. Almost all the rest is down in those aquifers under the ground, which, as I already told you, we're using unsustainably. So what about all the lakes and rivers that we see everywhere, the surface water? You probably didn't even notice, but there's a little sliver on that pie chart. That's all of that surface water. OMG, right? Now, there's another supply problem. We have a changing climate. The planet is warming up. What that means is that glaciers are melting. And you might say, well, who cares? Well, in the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalayas, the meltwater off of those glaciers is the source of most of the major river systems that run through Asia, which is the source of fresh water for more than one and a half billion people and growing. As those glaciers disappear, there will be less flow in those rivers. Where will those people get their water? I don't know. Another challenge with climate change and water is droughts. We are seeing more severe droughts than we have in many, many thousands of years. In California right now, there's a drought that's been going on for five years, and we're all familiar with the impact that is having. The drought that's in the Middle East right now is the worst in 900 years. That's climate change. Another challenge to our surface water is that we are polluting those rivers and lakes to an unprecedented degree, whether that is by discharging sewage untreated or industrial effluents or, or what have you. And so the blue water is turning into gray water in many places. So we've got a serious supply problem. What about the other side of the equation? What about demand for water? Well, there's bad news there too. By the year 2050, it is projected that global demand for water will be 55% higher than it is today. So what we have here is plummeting supply, skyrocketing demand for the single most important material on Earth. What does that mean? It means that just as in the last century, oil conflicts shaped much of our geopolitical order, in this century, it's going to be water conflicts that are going to shape our world. And this is not just something to look for in the future, it's already happening today. Conflicts are bubbling up in Central Asia, around the Aral Sea, in South India, between Bolivia and Chile, in the Nile Basin, all over the world. This is already starting to show up. Now, you may think, here's some environmentalist tree hugger trying to tell you a, a sad story. If you want to know the truth with something like this, you do what you always do when you want to find the truth, you follow the money. So there was this movie that came out last year called The Big Short. For those who haven't seen it, The Big Short was uh, based on the true story of the global financial meltdown we had in the late 2000s caused by the housing bubble. Now, in that movie, there was a character played by Christian Bale there who saw this before anybody else did. And that's a, he's based on a real guy. His name's Michael Burry. So Michael Burry knew before all of us did that there was a housing bubble, and he made a killing financially because of this. 
If you watch this movie at the end, it tells you Michael Burry today is focusing all of his trading on one commodity. Guess what it is? Water. So follow the money. Now, water crisis is not just a story of the future, as I said. Water crisis is already part of daily life in many places in the world today. Every 90 seconds, a child somewhere on Earth dies because of a water-related disease. In the few short minutes that I'm standing on this stage, another 10 lives will have been lost for this reason. In places like India and large swaths of Africa, millions of girls, and it's mostly girls, are trapped by water. And what I mean by that is they don't have a pipe of water coming into their home for their needs in their home. They have to walk often more than a mile in one direction to collect that water for everything they're going to do in their home, cooking, cleaning, you name it. And they have to carry that water back, often more than one trip each day. What that means is they never get to go to school, and they never get to enter the workforce like their male siblings. Now, it's not all bad news. There's some good news about water. One is that you cannot use up water. The water that's on Earth has been here for billions of years, and it is not going anywhere. There's lots of it. It just keeps going through the water cycle that you learned about in school. What that means is those water molecules have been around for a really long time. Those are some old molecules. When you take a drink of water, every single one of those molecules at some point in its long life has been inside an oak tree or blasted out by a volcano or urinated by a dinosaur. <laughs> That's true. We're all drinking dinosaur pee. <laughs> Which sounds gross, but it, it actually teaches you another important piece of good news about water. And that is that it does not matter how dirty you make water, you can always make it clean again. Whatever ends up in that water, can be taken out. So this brings me to how we're going to find our way out of this crisis. And it's the, the three R's that you all are familiar with. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Let me explain what these mean in the context of water. So reduce is simple enough. For God's sakes, turn off the tap when you're brushing your teeth. But that actually is only going to make a relatively small impact. If you want to make a big impact in your reduction of water, you got to reduce your virtual water consumption. That means start thinking a little more carefully about your consumption of things like dairy and meat, eat local. All the things that you do to reduce your carbon footprint and live a more sustainable life will also lower your water footprint. Reuse. We spend a lot of energy cleaning up water to drinking water qualities and then pump it into those water mains to come to your, to your home or your business. Not everything needs drinking quality water. Once that water's been used for one purpose, it can be reused without much of any treatment for another purpose. For example, for irrigating some landscaping. It doesn't need to be especially clean or running through an industrial boiler. But the real game changer for making a difference here is recycling. Now, water recycling is something Mother Nature has been doing for billions of years. I told you that water's been here since essentially the formation of Earth. And it's not going anywhere, so it is being recycled. But Mother Nature takes her sweet time in doing that. We can't afford to wait for Mother Nature to recycle water. But what we can do is develop some advanced technologies to short-circuit that process. Take that wastewater and clean it up directly back to the quality that you need and put it back into the system. For that, we really are going to need some new innovations. That's the kind of stuff that we work on at places like Argonne National Laboratory and lots of other research institutions around the world. So I told you at the beginning that water is invisible, hidden all around us. If we can all start seeing water, see it in the food that you eat, see it in the things that you use and wear every day of your life, I think we can all find a more sustainable way to use the most important material on Earth. Thank you.